Well, hi, everyone, and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy, and I'm back continuing my series on the disinformation dozen from the Center for Control of Digital Hate, uh, the anti-vaxxers that are responsible for some 65 to 70 percent of all anti-vax propaganda on the social media networks. I'm joined today by Dr. Dan Wilson, who is a molecular biologist, uh, an expert in messenger RNA, and uh, a, has a very good scientific understanding of the mechanism of action uh, of vaccinations. So welcome, Dr. Wilson. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm great, Bob. Good to be back. Oh, I'm glad to have you back. Today, I would like to talk about the godfather of the anti-vax movement, and that is Dr. Joseph McCullough. Uh, I'm sure you're quite familiar with him. He is one of the leading members of the anti-vax community. And along with Dale Bigtree and Robert F. Kennedy Jr., uh, those three individuals of the disinformation dozen are responsible for about half of the total disinformation being put out. He is very prolific. And let's talk about him for a few minutes. What are your thoughts on Dr. McCullough? Yeah, so... Mercola is an interesting member of the disinformation dozen, mostly because he is so prolific and he is, he has profited so much from the disinformation that he spreads. His net worth is estimated to be over $100 million. And he makes all that money through the multiple companies that he has spreading health disinformation. And because he has the, those letters in front of his name, uh, it goes a long way to him get, lending credibility to bogus ideas like homeopathy, um, the ideas that vaccines are bad. And He's the guy that was responsible for the idea that if you inhaled hydrogen peroxide and bleached your respiratory tract, that would somehow yeah. treat COVID, wasn't it? Yeah, the, he's he was a proponent of the idea that uh, 0.5 to 3% hydrogen peroxide solution nebulized um, and inhaled could prevent or cure COVID-19. Um, you understand hydro hydrogen peroxide is rocket fuel, right? In, in higher concentrations. <laughs> yeah. It's extraordinarily yeah. Cox caustic. Yeah. It, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be breathing it in, expecting it to uh, cure a virus. <laughs> You know, I, I would expect it to denude your respiratory epithelium, but uh, okay. hey, what do I know? I'm only a doctor, too, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's going to pretty much burn your nasopharynx and destroy your cells All before right. it gets to any virus. Now, McCullough has his own little thing that he does, but as you mentioned, um, this is a financial empire that he has. He is described on uh, the Center for Control of Digital Hate, not as a physician, but as an entrepreneur. Yeah. And I think that's kind of interesting. And as you said, you know, there's a there's a great quote from one of the Batman movies and that, you know, uh, uh, the Flash, I think it was, asked Bruce Wayne what his superpower was. He can run really fast. What's your superpower? And Bruce Wayne just kind of looked over at him as I'm extraordinarily rich, <laughs> and uh, that's kind of a superpower in its own. It and is. he's used that wealth not only to promote his own businesses, but promote other things. For example, I believe he financed the movie Vaxxed and yeah. Uh, yeah. several of the other uh, projects in the anti-vax movement. He's been a financial supporter of people like uh, Andrew Wakefield. Mm -hmm. and, yep. um, and some of these other members of the disinformation doesn't. That's another thing that I think that we probably should talk about sometime too, and that is the way that these 12 people work together. So, for example, Del Bigtree will host a conference, and Andrew Wakefield and Robert F. Kennedy will be the featured speakers. And then Robert Kennedy will host a conference, and it will be Dale and, and, and Wakefield as the speakers. And then Wakefield will host a conference. And it'll, you know, uh, it'll be Kennedy and, 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 and Wakefield talking at his conference. So you get to market the same people three times with almost identical messages. Right. And each one makes more money because people pay for each one. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, these conferences, I think um, 
some of the numbers that I've seen bring in like $250,000 for a weekend conference. Oh yeah. And, uh, you know, it's very, very lucrative. And they realize that by working together, uh, they, they tend to make more money than working individually. So let's talk a little bit more about McCullough. He is quite politically active. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, He's been interviewed by people like um, like Bannon and yeah. Fox News and, and some of these other, um, well, I don't know if he's been interviewed by Fox News, but, you know, he's a regular, he's a regular on InfoWars and, you know, a lot of these conspiratorial type quasi news programs or talk shows. Right. Um, has that caused him any issues? Well, um I don't think it's him going on those shows that has caused him issues, but I mean, the sad part is those shows can exist and it's hard for regulators to go after them because although they're spreading disinformation, the FDA is really limited in what they can actually do um, to stop people from saying these things and selling supplements because if they sell things as supplements, the FDA can't really do anything about it. Or food products. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, Mercola's website, the FDA did take action against Mercola uh, in 2021 uh, when they sent him a warning letter. Um, and uh, he had to take down his whole website. Um, I remember when that was happening, he would... He tried uploading articles and then they were on a timer where they would disappear. Uh, he kept trying to get around it, but eventually his website just had to just, his website just went away um, because he was actively, um, he was actively selling so many uh, products and ideas that just were harmful. Uh, and of course, Mercola blamed that whole takedown of his website on Bill Gates and Big Pharma. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't his fault at all <laughs> never is is it no you know that's another thing that you see a lot of with the disinformation doesn't um people may recall that a few years ago this report that i i'm actually citing um the center for control of digital hate report was brought before the u.s congress and hearings were held with representatives of facebook and youtube and a lot of the social media groups twitter and they made attempts based on the information in this report to try and start restricting the spread of some of this misinformation. Now, private companies, as you know, are not covered under the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, this is my website. Uh, if I don't want something on it, I'm well within my rights to take it off. Right. Uh, same thing with yours. Uh, we're not government agencies, so free speech doesn't have anything to do with private individuals and what YouTube for example did was it demonetized a lot of these disinformation channels and stopped making them recommended videos mm -hmm. and you can still search for them they're still there they're just not being promoted and they seem to have a problem with that because they think it's unfair and there's actually been a lot of lawsuits saying you know talking about how much money they're losing by not being by being deplatformed from YouTube. Right. But one of the strategies they do is to try and evade the ban. Uh, they try and get around it. And something that they talk about an awful lot of is let's have um, some sanctuary areas where we can just fall back on. So what they'll do is they'll be a YouTube channel, but they'll mirror that YouTube content to places like Powler and uh, Telegram and BitChute. Right. And rumble. Uh, so and rumble and so if youtube takes them down they say okay well you know we don't believe in censorship so come over to us on BitChute, you right. know where they where we can do whatever we want and there's a lot of strategies being involved uh, we discussed um, a couple of videos ago talked about the anti-vax playbook that they have where they try and promote the message COVID is a very minor illness, vaccines are dangerous, and, and natural or herd immunity is the only way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, with a corollary that, you know, if it's a natural medicine that I happen to sell you for $500, you can take that too. But part of the strategy that came out of that conference uh, was to make sure that you had backup and mirrors 
to prevent, you know, to to offset this effort to reduce the amount of transmission of your derp. So what else right. do we have with Mr. McCullough? Well, he is um, also a fan of just conspiracy theories. He spreads this idea of the Great Reset and is, of course, against lockdowns and vaccine passports. Um, and he spreads all of these conspiracy theories behind a lot of just biology bunk, like uh, a lot of misunderstanding or intentional misunderstanding of how vaccines work and what vaccines are. Um, I believe he is a proponent of the idea that COVID vaccines are not vaccines. You raised an excellent point in your video, and I watched all 12 of your videos, and I'd recommend everybody on the Bob the Science Guy channel and every other channel I have, go watch him and watch him twice, because he really does strong work over on his channel. And one of the points that you made in this section on your review was the flu vaccine. Now, some years we get a really good flu vaccine because, you know, we have to plan this out two years in advance. We go to China where the flu comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, for various reasons, and whatever's in China is going to hit the United States in about two years, mm -hmm. in, in general. So we look at what's circulating in China, we decide what strains that we're going to have. Generally, it's H1N1 plus two other strains, so it's a trivalent or a quadvalent uh, flu vaccine. It takes time to manufacture those in chicken eggs and, you know, however it is we manufacture it, mm -hmm. and then we roll it out. Well, some years we get 70-80% effectiveness of the vaccine some years we don't we we get much less you know, on the order of 40 percent or or lower mm -hmm. the point that you made was that even if it was 28 percent if you can get enough effectiveness out of a flu vaccine you can drive the r naught of the flu below one now right. the r naught means that if i have the flu how many people will i infect all right if i infect one other person the disease continues if yeah. I infect two, the disease expands and, and becomes, you know, more epidemic. However, mm -hmm. if I infect less than one, eventually that disease is going to shrink down and go away. Mm -hmm. And 28% is enough to make influenza drop the r naught below one. Right. Yeah. If, if everybody, I mean, flu vaccination rates every year in America are abysmal. Um, yeah. It's a very poor uptake, but if everybody got vaccinated every year for flu, I don't think flu would be much of a problem at all because as it is, tens of thousands of people die from it every year, many times more get hospitalized. The vaccine, if everybody takes it at the proper time of the season, not only will they reduce their chances of infection during that season, but if they do get infected, then they have a better chance of not going to the hospital or dying. The problem that you run into is people like McCullough that have have degrees like we do, mm -hmm. you know, they think that their derp should be taken with the same degree of conviction that something you and I say does. Right, right. And they can take advantage of gullible people that want to hear that from their expert. Mm -hmm. uh, in our next, uh, our next episode, I'd like to talk about one of my personal uh, pet peeves with the anti-vax disinformation dozen, and that's Dr. Andrew Wakefield, mm. a man that took his degree and sold himself to a group of attorneys trying to sue pharmaceutical companies, Right, falsified his data to try and take out the MMR vaccination and substitute his own vaccination that he developed and was trying to patent in Canada. Yep. to replace the MMR to enrich himself. So that's going to be somebody I want to talk about next time. So For sure. Yeah. Do you have any closing thoughts, Dan? Do you want to do you want to leave the audience with anything today? I think I'll just say um with Mer when it comes to people like Mercola um and his wife who complain about censorship, you know, he's someone who causes real harm with his disinformation and in his case taking action against him and his websites 
does have a real impact and limits the amount of harm he can he can do. So the First Amendment doesn't give him the right to mislead people and lie to them and profit off of their suffering. And I think that addressing them and where possible taking action against them is necessary. One of the problems that you run into with conspiracy theories and science denial is that you know, I, I'm asked many times, why do I bother with flat earthers? Mm -hmm. Flat earthers are a source of amusement and are relatively harmless. However, the thought process behind flat earth and conspiracy theory and conspiratorial yeah. thinking leads directly to this sort of stuff. The stuff yeah. that McCola and the others prey upon. That mm -hmm. gullibility, that lack of knowledge, that wanting to believe something and have special knowledge. Mm -hmm. All right. These are people that lost their faith in the experts, quote unquote. Yep. And um, there are always people out here like this that will prey on individuals like that. And the way this happens is you have somebody like this that writes the script. You know, we've heard of the tobacco script. We've heard of uh, we've heard of the anti-vax playbook. Mm -hmm. But you have these people that write the script, and then you have the susceptible people. To receive it but you have to transmit the, the idea between the two and that's where facebook and youtube and the social media platforms and the internet come in mm -hmm. if you can break that chain if that's that's one of the reasons i wanted to put this out and actually the strategy to approach these people is twofold one is don't talk about them at all don't get their message out because they love the attention yeah. The other way to do it, and the way that not many people should, is that if you actually can do content rebuttal, if right. you are an expert in the field, we need to come out and talk about this. Mm -hmm. And we need to do it in a way that people can relate to. And I hope that that's, that's my goal in this series. And that's one of the reasons I really wanted to get some experts in here. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for joining me. Well, thanks. For having me, Bob, and I totally agree with that goal. Mama, please make them hear me. Or I can't teach them anymore. Bye.